All right, hello everyone, welcome to today's video. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to beat the Jabal in London with the black pieces. And before I really get into the meat of this video and show you guys the line that I personally play, I just wanna show you some of the other moves that black can play in this position, apart from the move that I recommend here, which is to play c5, to really kind of give you a sort of a more broad understanding of what he's really aiming for when they play the Jabal in London here. And the first move that's really worth checking and one that's very natural is this move bishop f5. And objectively, there's honestly nothing too wrong with this move. However, what I don't really like about it is that, in general, this bishop can be a bit of a target for white pawns later on, where they can start avalanching down the board with f3, g4. And the thing you have to understand is, that unlike a normal London system where a knight would be on f3, because there's no knight on f3, that means a pawn can come to the square and allow white to do more aggressive things, like playing f3, g4, h4. For example, one very common way play can continue here is f3 here, bishop b4 maybe, and again we see his g4 idea, h4 here, and already I think the black maybe they're not like losing or anything, but objectively uh, white already definitely has a slightly more pleasant position in my opinion. And another somewhat logical move in this position would be to play something like e6 here, just trying to like develop the bishop out, castle very quickly here, but if we just follow this sort of sequence here of e3, bishop e7, here white once again has a very nice idea that's very in the spirit of the Jabal in London here, they're not just going to develop the knight, the bishop, they're going to play this move g4 here, once again showing their very aggressive intention. And if we just castle here, we're sort of like castling into it here, the white is going to once again like throw their pawns forward here, h4, and surprisingly white already is doing very well here, it's not very easy for black to actually come that white here they could play something like c5 uh, but the center isn't very easy to open like it's often said in chess so like you know when your opponent plays in the flank we should counter them in the center here but it's like okay i mean how are we going to do that like they just keep playing these moves here if we take they take back here it's not easy to play e5 and open things up here which is sort of what justifies this whole setup for white which, coming back to this position, is once again why I'm recommending this move c5 here. I really like this immediately gaining counterplay in the center here, attacking the d4 pawn, a very principled move here. And right off the bat here, it's worth pointing out that both of these moves, knight b5 here, attacking the c7 square, which might look a bit scary at first. This just fails to queen a5 check here because now we're forcing the knight back to c3, right where it came from. And if white plays a move like d takes c5, now we get d4 kicking the knight away. And note how it can't go to any good squares. Once again, knight b5 here, queen a5 check. If it goes to e4, I mean, we just take it. And that means it probably has to go back to a score like b1. But again, if we go like knight 6 e5 next, maybe queen a5 check and pick this pawn up. Black just has a very good position here. So in this position here, white's main move is to usually play e3, backing up the d4 pawn like this. However, before we get to e3, I want to show a very tricky line that's become somewhat trendy recently. I believe Hans Niemann even recommended this in his lifetime repertoires, Joe Barvin London course here, where he suggested this move e4 here. And this feels very much like actually if we flip the board here, the Alban counter gambit except sort of white has an extra tempo almost, where black plays e5 here, takes and usually d4 from black here. However, one big difference is the fact that we have these pair of knights developed here, which gives black the extra option of not taking with the pawn, but rather taking with the knight here. And after knight takes e4 here, d takes e4 here, white kind of has two options, they can push the pawn as in the Alban counter gambit, Usually that's not what people do though, because when you push d5, here what you're usually going to do is g6, develop the bishop this way, castle very quickly here, and black more or less just has a fine position. And also I should note, because we're a pawn up in the first place, we're not too worried about like white winning this pawn back on e4. We're not going to try and make all sorts of concessions in our position, for example, like playing f5, that would be very weakening. We're okay if white sort of spends some time to regain the pawn, because at the end of the day what we care most about in this position is finishing our development and getting our king safe. So what people usually do with white here instead of playing d5 is to play d takes c5 here. Uh, however, this also isn't too scary. We go queen f5 check, c3 takes here. White will usually win back the pawn very forcefully with queen a4 check here. Queen takes e4. And here you sort of have two options. The one I'm going to recommend, the one that feels safest to me, is just to play g6, bishop g7, castles. And it's very difficult for white to actually pose any problems here. Black is already pretty much equalized. Or you could play the very tempting bishop f5. I personally don't like this as much just because we're sort of delaying our development here. And after queen a4 here, we usually go e5. 
Playing g6 with the bishop on f5 kind of feels a bit strange because the bishop is kind of restricted by this pawn here, which is why usually people here will play e5, but then after bishop e3, we're sort of getting kicked around a bit, and I don't really love this, which is once again why coming back to this position, we can play bishop f5 anytime we want, I feel like, but for now I just want to play this bishop g7 castles, and maybe in the future we can even play a move like e5 and start gaining space in the center, kick this bishop away, etc, etc. So that is why in this position here, although e4 is somewhat of a trendy move and popular, it's not that scary if you know what you're doing here, play knight takes e4, all that good stuff, and again, that's why e3 here, most popular move, backing up the d4 pawn here, very logical stuff. And here again, we need to be a little bit careful. And what I'm going to suggest is to play c takes d4 here, followed by a6. And you might kind of be asking, like, Sam, why are we playing c takes d4 here and then a6? Why aren't we playing a6 immediately? And that's a good question. The answer is simply that when we play a6 immediately here, we actually don't want to keep this pawn on the board here. We want to exchange it off. Which essentially means here that I can play d takes c5, and it's not necessarily that we're just straight up losing the pawn, it's more so that we have to make some concessions in order to win back this pawn, for example like e6 here, knight a4, bishop c5, and after this position here, we have given up the bishop here, here. yes we have the two central pawns, but it's not very easy to push e5 here, because white's always going to get knight a3 in time, controlling the e5 square before we play knight 6 e5, and to me it just feels like white has a pleasant slight advantage in this sort of position. Which is why once again I like to play c takes d4 here, takes now a6, and again white has a bit of an option here. I should also note very quickly here, actually this might take a bit of time, the knight b5 here is a bit of a tricky move here. And we don't simply just want to play knight a6 defending the square like this, because after e takes d4 here, white actually has quite a significant advantage with our knight sort of being misplaced on this a6 square like this. Which means after knight b5 check here that we have to play very principled chess here with queen a5 check. And the difference between the other position like we saw how here on this move knight b5 just ran to queen a5 check. Uh, but now things are slightly different because after knight b5 here, queen a5 check and this bishop actually protects the knight. So that means now after queen a5 check, white has some options like they can either play c3 or b4 here. I should know after something like c3, I consider b4 to be most critical, but let's say c3 here, uh, if they just simply like take back for example, that's not really anything to be worried about because now we go knight a6 here, we're a pawn up, we cover these threats. However, what is a little bit more scary is something like also I should note in this position here if they go knight c7 check, after like king d8, I don't really think this is again anything to be worried about if they go knight takes a8 here. Then we simply go c takes b2 check, we're going to be winning back the material very soon. But rather what is a little bit scary is in this position, and actually you're going to see a transposition to this very soon, is if white plays a move like b4 here, because now if the queen takes b4 here, knight takes a8, it's not so simple to win back the material. We have c2 check here, this is our best move, but after queen d2, it's not very clear how we go about punishing white in this sort of position here. So just to backstep a little bit here, usually the way you will get this and will transpose very quickly is white will play b4 first here, queen takes b4 c3, d takes c3, then knight c7 check, king d8 takes here, and again we have the same position after c2 check here, queen d2, and this is where things are a little bit tricky. But basically here in this position we have to start playing a forcing sequence of moves here, starting with e5, opening the bishop up on this diagonal here, if white takes this, we're very happy to see that, we're going to win the bishop next, so that's no problem. If bishop e5 here, this is the most printed move, now I play knight c6. And the most common move in the database here is for white to play bishop c3. However, the problem is that now after queen b1 check here, queen c1, now we're going to be playing this move bishop f5, a very strong move protecting this queen like this. So if white does take it, I mean we're just going to end up material at the end of this whole sequence. Let me count the pieces, so we have four minors. White has four minors, except this guy's going to get trapped next, so, I mean, yeah, technically we are going to be up material. And you might say, but, like, you know, White doesn't have to take here on b1, they can just play a move like knight f3. And that's sort of true, except for the fact we have bishop a3 here, and again, White can't take this due to the pin, which forces them once again to sort of make a, I mean, capture here. Uh, but again, like, if this happens, we're pretty happy to see this, we're going to end up up material. So like technically what white's best move in this position is is to do bishop takes f6 check but after takes here again it's very difficult to play this like apparently the best move is like rook c1 bishop f5 like 92 or something but 
no one's really going to play like this. For example, a, a much more common approach here is to play bishop d3, trying to round up this pawn like this. However, after the very strong move, queen b2 check here. Sorry, not even check. We're threatening this rook once again on a1. If they go rook c1, I, by the way, should mention that this just runs into bishop d4, which is why they usually go queen c1 here. But now after queen c3 check, this is a very bad situation uh, for white since they can't go back to d2 because then they'd be hanging the rook. And if they go to e2, then once again, we have this move bishop a3, and if the queen takes, goodbye rook on a1. So that's a very long-winded way of saying that basically in this position here, knight b5 is kind of tricky, and if you don't know what you're doing, you might get slapped in the face, but if you do know what you're doing, you're going to have a good time. But that's why usually people take on d4, and b 5 is pretty rare, but occasionally I'll have a guy or two who's like, you know, he's trying to test me a little bit, he wants to see if I know my stuff, and sometimes it goes badly, but if it goes well, it goes very well. But nonetheless here, e takes d4, a6. Stick into the game plan, stopping this whole knight b5 issue now, because in this position, like if you just go knight c6, this is actually very bad after knight b5. Queen a5 check, this definitely doesn't work now, because after c3, there's just no stopping this. So you really do have to play a6 at this point. And again, white has a bit of a choice here. The by far two main moves are to play bishop d3 or knight f3. And, I, and these both have their merits to them. Bishop d3, essentially what white is saying is that they don't want their knight to easily get pinned here and on the square like f3 because after bishop g4, this is very unpleasant. By the way, I should note that in these sorts of positions, if white is able to play like, sorry, black rather, is able to play knight to 6 and bishop g4 for knight and f3 and just pin this guy like this, that's pretty much like mission accomplished there, and you don't really need to know too much from there. Black already has a very pleasant game. Which is why usually in these positions here after knight c6, knight f3 is not so good for white, and this scores absolutely horrendously, because after bishop g4, once again, this is just very pleasant. Like already white might have to play a move like bishop e2 going back, because of this move, knight takes d4, or bishop takes f3, and then knight takes d4, is such a nasty threat, which is very difficult to deal with. Which usually is why in this position people will play knight g2 instead. But again, we'll play bishop g4 anyway, develop this guy out f3. And we do have to sort of watch out for this pawn storm here. But in this position, it's not really a big deal. We just continue our development. White might try this. h6 here to stop in g5. We could also allow it, but personally I'm not a big fan. So h6 here. One castles and uh, I like b5 quite a bit here. And we're going to see in the example game later how you might be able to sort of handle these sorts of situations. But already like we don't need to rush in the castling I would say. And we can just sort of start up our own thing on the queen side here. Some sample ideas could be like bringing the rook to the c file, queen a5 and then b4. Maybe just knight b4. Oh uh, yeah but all in all once again black is doing very well here. And the other move that you sort of need to know what you're doing against is this move knight of 3 here. And the black sort of has two options. And again, remember, like, if knight c6, the bishop moves somewhere, like, to e2. Here we can go bishop f5 or bishop g4, and we're pretty happy here. But what usually is going to happen, with, at least with more sort of knowledgeable Joe Barber London players, is that they're going to play this move knight e5 here, stopping you from pinning their knight here with bishop g4. And basically what they're aiming for is some sort of structure like this, where they go knight a4 and they stop you from playing c5 very easily. Like, yeah, you could still do this in this sort of position here, where you get something like this. But I mean, white does have the bishop pair here, the position's a little bit more opened up here. So white's kind of happy if they get this on the board. So personally here, I'm not a big fan of knight c6. It's perfectly playable, I will say this. But I prefer in this position to play bishop g4, pinning this knight here. And again, if white develops the bishop, as I've mentioned, I think like the third or fourth time now, knight c6 and we're just very happy in this sort of position. This is sort of our dream. We just play e6, bishop d6. If you don't want to trade bishops, you can go bishop e7. But in general, what I'll say about these positions is that when sort of white doesn't really, like the reason this is so good for black is that like when you put the knight on c3, you have to remember that like, if you don't do something concrete, this really is just a positional concession because you're blocking the c-pawn from like protecting this d4 pawn and now especially with the king castle short, you don't really have any constructive like plan in this position except maybe playing like 95 and trying to like swap some pieces off here. Which is why in this position instead of bishop e2 what people usually do is play h3 here trying to kick this bishop around and the thing I'll show you right now is that you don't want to play bishop h5 because after g4 here 
bishop g6, knight e5 here, a quick h4, h5 here, and all of a sudden this could actually be quite scary for black here, so you really need to make sure you avoid this. Like for example, to illustrate like why is like you might be like, oh okay, I can just go like h6 here and my bishop can run away, but now after simply takes our kingside structure is ruined, this pawn on g6 is very weak, the pawn on e6 is isolated backward pawn here, so yeah, you don't want to go into this, this is very bad. This is something you really want to drill into your brain, it's something you don't go into, and why in this position after h3 here, you take the damn thing, and now you go e6 here, and basically you go for this plan of knight c6, bishop d6 here, uh, you try to neutralize the bishop here, and once again we're going to castle, play b5, start something up on the queen side, and white attack here on the king side isn't really too scary. For example, for example, if they play g5 here, we're going to take the bishop, check, and after knight h5 here, let's say they go queen e3, if they go like queen g4 here, I think we just go like g6, and again, it's not very easy for them to make progress on the king side, and then let's say queen e3 though, now we just go queen d6 here, we have very nice control over the f4 square here, which our knight could potentially be coming to in the future, again b5, rook c8, short castles, completely fine position for white. Sorry, black rather. So now that you guys more or less know all the theory you know to play the black side of the Jabal in London here, I just wanted to show a practical game of my own that I had with the black pieces last year. This was an online rapid game actually that was played in the university match between my uni and some other university in Australia. And I was playing against a guy who was right around 2000, who was actually a childhood friend of mine here, and he played the Jabal in London, which, yeah, I mean, I was pretty happy to see once again because of all the stuff I've showed you guys in this video. Once again, takes here, a6, knight, f3, bishop, g4, as I preach, h3 here, and we essentially have this line where, instead of playing bishop d6 here, I played bishop e7, which wasn't the most accurate move here, because now just g5 is quite unpleasant, knight d7, h4. Once again, remember in the other line here, because of bishop d6 trading off the dark with bishops here, now with something like h5 here, we're very quick to get the control of the dark squares with knight h5 and queen d6, if allowed of course, which is sort of why bishop e7 wasn't the best move here, but I was quite lucky in that my opponent didn't really appreciate the subtle nuance and just played bishop e3 instead, a very passive move which confused me a bit, protecting the d4 pawn, maybe trying to prepare bishop d3, but they didn't really play bishop d3 at all in this game, which sort of made this even more confusing. But nonetheless here, uh, I could castle, but I wasn't really in any real rush the way I saw it. I want to prioritize my sort of attack on the queen side here, so I played rook c8, king b1 here, queen a5, once again I've mentioned this idea before, bishop f4, again very confusing, it's like you just moved here buddy, like why are you coming back? But anyways b5 here, and at this point I think black, if they didn't have an advantage already, it was very difficult to play for white given all the tempos they'd given up. And at this point my opponent kind of freaked out here, he played bishop e5, well I don't know if he freaked out, but like you get my point, he didn't really play such a good move. Like at the very least here, I mean black can just play this and go knight d7 and this pawn is weak, but I thought I had something even more active with playing b4 here, and not to mention doing all this like my opponent gives up one of the few advantages he had in the position, which was a bishop pair, right, but anyways after b4 here, knight e2 forcing this knight back to a much more passive square, and I thought that after takes takes, I mean again I could go knight d7 try and like pick up this pawn or something, but I thought that I could exploit the fact that I just kicked this knight away from his active post now, and go knight e4, a very much more active move let's say, and I even have some like sneaky tactical threats maybe, of going something like let's say bishop g2, of going something like b3 here, and I could win an exchange. However, this is a bit artificial to be honest, and there's probably some even stronger ideas as we're going to see in the game, namely after knight c1 here, I thought for a couple minutes here, and I mean once again this is a rapid game, I don't have all the time to think in the world, but I basically figured out that knight c3's got to be pretty good, if white just moves the king I win the exchange, so if they take, take, now the king is wide open now, and I was pretty sure like at the moment queen a3, the queen b2 was a threat, and so white played knight d3, but I was like, I, okay, I mean, like, white's only defender around the king is a knight here, the king's wide open, I can bring these rooks in quickly, this one and after I castle this one as well, my bishop can also somehow get involved, there's simply no way that white's gonna survive this, and here, like, I could just play an immediate check to the king here, but I thought even stronger was to simply play castles here, preparing something like rook c4 and then bringing the other rook in, and that's exactly what happened here, bishop e2, rook c4 here, king a1, and immediately I could have actually won if queen takes a2 here, and simply rook a4 check, and if king b3, rook a3 is a rather cute mate, and if they go this way, rook b8 here, king a, sorry, so king c1 rather, and rook a1 checkmate. 
However, um, I didn't see that. I'm human, I guess. I saw the second best move, which is happens to be good enough here with rook a4. And uh, after knight c1 here, queen b4, running this mate. And if they go knight b3, I mean, they're resigned here because they realize if they go here, then I simply go rook a2. If they take, that's also going to be checkmate and goodbye uh but anyways i hope you guys have enjoyed this video i hope that this has given you a good idea of how to beat the jubav in london the next time you see this in your own games but anyways please leave a like on the video subscribe if you're not already and uh, leave a comment down below if there's anything that you'd like to say but anyways i hope you guys have a good day